If you have your Bibles tonight, I'm going to ask you to take them out and to turn to Romans chapter 8. Tonight we're going to continue from where we stopped at this morning. The Apostle Paul shares some things with us this morning that, that rattled our cage and got us to thinking about life in the Spirit. But I think if there's one danger in the Christian life, it is to be carnally minded. And Paul recognized that as a threat to life a spirit-filled life, living a life of victory. If we are fleshly minded, carnally minded, then it is going to have its impact upon us because that will be our thought pattern. I heard of a, a young girl who grew up in a wealthy European home. She was born with a disfigurement on her face. And for many years, they were not able to, to fix that problem that she had. And so she grew up and she developed a certain image of herself in accordance with the problem that she had physically. Now, at a point in time, they discovered a plastic surgeon, a man who could deal with that particular feature problem, and they, they had this man come and do an operation upon her. Now, after everything had healed up and they unveiled her, everybody looked at her and said, she looks wonderful. It couldn't have worked better. But they gave her the mirror and it was so embedded upon her mind, the image that she had grown up with, that she looked in the mirror in spite of the difference and said, I knew it wouldn't work. I knew it wouldn't work. And it took that plastic surgeon six months to convince her of the difference that had, that had actually happened in her life because inside she had such an embedded sense of herself that she had grown up with. Many people are like that. You have grown up you have pre-existed before your conversion with a certain type person. And that person got embedded in you. That person's behaviors, that person's actions, the way that person thought, much of that has found a, a sense of comfort or a, it's the way you naturally act. And all of a sudden you're hit with the truths of Scripture, what God's promises can truly mean for you, and for many people, it is so foreign, so different, that they go back to what they used to be. You could be carnally minded and miss out on so much of what life in the Spirit can possibly be for you. And Paul recognized that that is a danger. As he made mention of it with the last thing that we looked at this morning, how the proof of that we really are born again, the proof that we are living by that that different law is that we are flying high like a plane flies with the law of aer aerodynamics in operation. You know it because the plane is flying. If that law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is in operation in your life, you know it by the demonstration of uh, the life of Christ flowing through you. And then Paul said the proof is that you will be living a different type of life. You'll not be walking according to the flesh, but walking according to the spirit. Now that's where we left off this morning. Tonight I want us to read four more verses, starting with verse 5, and think about the danger of being carnally minded. That can cause the destruction of the spirit-filled life. And if you do not get a proper mindset in your walk with God, a mindset of faith, a mindset set upon the promises of God and not the problems with your own particular performance, then you will fail in the spirit-filled life. You will miss out on what God has for you. Starting in verse 5, it says this, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. The mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Cannot please God. I mentioned this morning that Paul, one of the points that he made, or that he makes in the book of Romans, is that he does not mention the Holy Spirit until we get to chapter 8, other than twice. When we get to chapter 8, he mentions him 19 times. And the danger of running ahead, 
without proper foundation and running ahead and getting all out of whack in your theology of the Holy Spirit. And we see that happening in many churches around us. You know, Baptists have a different danger in Baptist life. And that is that Baptists will go on without the Holy Spirit. We have a danger of being so offended or so afraid about what we see out there that we don't embrace the Holy Spirit ourselves. And we miss out on the victorious Christian life because we don't embrace the power that the Holy Spirit offers for us. We have to have the proper mindset ourselves as well. I want you to think this morning about how you are setting your mind, because that's the first thing that Paul says. We are either setting our mind carnally, fleshly, or we are setting our mind according to the Spirit. Now, when you go to bed, unless you're Bobby Parker, you set your alarm clock for a right time so that you will wake up at a proper time. You, you uh, logistically do certain things with that, that, that alarm clock to make sure that it operates properly so that you will wake up. You know, I have slept through alarms, but usually it's because I've hit snooze buttons repeatedly. You know, usually the alarm will wake me up initially. I'm not that deep a sleeper. But just like you would set that clock, you have to set your mind a certain way. It, it doesn't just naturally happen. You have to set the function buttons in your mind and get your thinking a proper way. Get God's promises instilled. Learn what God's Word says and set your mind accordingly. A mindset by the flesh is something that's going to naturally happen in the world around you. The world around you is going to naturally program you to be just like it. Unless you counteract that programming by setting yourself according to the promises of God, according to the truths and principles of Scripture, you're going to find yourself being programmed according to the world. To the world. If you look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Set your mind on the things above and not the things that are on, earth, on the earth. What is your mindset tonight? What is your mindset? I want you to think about that. How are you programmed? Are you programmed according to the principles of God's Word? Now, how would you answer that question? Well, let me ask you about what do you predominantly think about? When you're not thinking about anything else, what do you think about? What is important to you? What is your particular view of life? What, what are some things that you value in life? All those things are indicators of your particular mindset that you have. Where are your affections? What really gives you chill bumps and excites you and motivates you? The things of the world or the things that God would have for your life? Now, that will tell you whether your mind is ordered or set according to the flesh or set according to the spirit. If you think about the mindset, the mindset of the world or the mindset of the uh, uh, fallen human nature, all you have to do is really look around. Just look at the world. The world has it set in order. What is important to the world? All those are indicators about what the worldly mindset is all about. To the world, success is viewed by having all the things that the flesh desires to have. Having all the things that the flesh desires to have. If you go to a motivational seminar, some guy will probably get up there and he'll begin asking you, well, what kind of house would you like to have? What kind of salary would you like to have? Where would you like to go on vacation? And for the average person, that gets them excited. That gets them stirred up. And they're ready to hear whatever you got to say if it can get those things for them. Because they have a mindset that is carnal rather than spiritual. Those are the things that are up to the top of their priority list. When you think of the world, four things that I, I think are important to the world. Number one, it's important to them that they make money. That they make money. They like comforts, they like conveniences, and money provides those things. A second thing, it's important that they have fun. That they have fun. 
Pleasure is a very important thing. If this this will bring pleasure into my life. There's a very hedonistic atmosphere out there. The more things that I can get that will fill up my life with entertainment, those things are important. Fame is important to the world. Not necessarily to have their name on a marquee with the latest movie, but just to be known. To have influence, to have other people care what you think, what you have, have to say. Just to have standing before other people. That's important. And the fourth thing would be to be fulfilled. To fulfill themselves. Those things are important to the world. But the problem is that they misapply having those things accomplished in their life. They do it with the wrong end. The end for them is man. All those things that I read are not necessarily things that God does not want for you. But God wants those things to happen in your life in accordance with the end being God and not man. But a person who tries to get those things with the end being man is a person whose mindset is set on the flesh. I want to share four statements with you tonight connecting them to these verses. Four statements about the carnally minded person. Statement one, number one is that the first step to being carnally minded is to set your affections on fulfilling the desires of the flesh. To set your affections on fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Have you set your affections there? Are well, the priorities to you the things that are the priority to, to the world around you? If you have the mindset of the Spirit of God, it's going to be different. There are some wrong conclusions that, that are out there. They think if you have your mindset on the Spirit, then you, you definitely don't ever want to make money. Some people say that if you are a Christian, you have your mindset on the Spirit, you definitely don't want to have any fun. They might also say that to be a Christian is to be totally unknown, to not have any influence at all, or maybe to live the Christian life. And this is probably the biggest one that the world thinks, is to live a life that's unfulfilled. You are just denying yourself all the things that the world has for you. You know, I would share with you tonight that all of those things are really only possible if your mind is set on the Spirit. The world sets those things up as goals, but they never attain them. They get a lot of money, but it's never enough money. They think they are having fun, but they're never having the kind of joy that God can give them. They're trying to be fulfilled, but they never find that satisfaction that can only come in a relationship with Jesus Christ. For the Christians, they can have treasures in heaven, money beyond this world much less what God provides in this world. They can have the ability to share wealth and to invest in the kingdom of God. A Christian can, can have real fun, not just fake fun, counterfeit fun that is unfulfilling. A Christian can be known by the one who really counts, that is God himself. One day Jesus is going to say to a whole crowd of people, I never knew you. Depart from me. Workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And finally we find out that a Christian is the only person that can walk this earth and be truly satisfied. The Bible tells us those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be the ones who will be truly satisfied. Now where is your mindset? tonight. Where are you setting the affections of your life? If you are primarily concerned with showing love to other people, helping others, speaking truth, loving God and seeking His glory, those are indicators that your mind is set in a proper direction. If your mindset is the end being God rather than the end being man, that's an evidence that your mind is set in the right direction. I got to looking in Scripture at different indicators of your mind being programmed right, of setting your mind toward the principles of God. In John 14, 17, if your mind is, is under the Spirit's control, then it will be directed toward truth. In Galatians 6, verse 8, if your mind is 
is set toward God, a characteristic of that is that you will be seeking to please the Holy Spirit by the way you live your life. In John 14, verse 26, like another characteristic is that your mind will be active in memorization and meditation of God's Word. In John 14, verse 26, you will be very sensitive to sin. And in Galatians 16, uh, Galatians 5, verses 16 through 22, you will be very eager to follow the Spirit's guidance in your life. All those are evidences that you have a mindset that is in accordance with God's will, that is in accordance not with the flesh, but with the Holy Spirit, a mindset on the Spirit. In verse 6, it says, the mindset on the flesh not is going to die, but is, is death. That statement is more of an equation than a consequence. There is actually walking death, living death, in a person whose mind is set on the flesh. To the opposite of that, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. You know, don't be fooled into believing that death is an event that's waiting to happen at the end of your life. Death is something that, that outside the life of God operating in you, that is the experience of many people in this world. Paul made a statement about a particular lady and said, giving herself to wanton pleasure, she is dead even while she lives. Dead even while she lives. You go walk out in the world this week, you're going to see a lot of dead people. Because they are absent of what is true life. The only indicator of true life is the life of God. The life of God within you and working through you. That is an evidence of life. You look at the world today and you can see lots of evidences of things that you might attribute to death. I got to studying this week and I found there are four elements to living death. And you see this in people's lives all the time. One of the elements is guilt. Guilt. That's an evidence that somebody is, is dead. They're absent of the life of God. Now this might show up in somebody's life as shame. It might show up as self-hatred or self-righteousness, perfectionism. But it's a sense of guilt working itself out. A second is hostility. Hostility. This might show up in hate, resentment, bitterness, revenge, cruelty. But it shows the absence of the life of God. The third element is emptiness. It can show up as loneliness, depression, discouragement, despair, a sense of meaning. We see these things all around us. The fourth would be fear. Phobia is about so many things in life. Guilt, hostility, emptiness, and fear. We see all that around us every day. People who have pursued things with the wrong, wrong mindset, the end result is they are living in death. And these are the consequences. These are the things that come back to their life. None of these things are satisfying at all. The mindset on the spirit brings a totally different return. Paul says here it brings life and peace. That word for life is the word zoe. It means the highest attainable life possible. The highest attainable life possible. That is what God offers in a relationship with him when we are filled with the Spirit and the principle, that law, that wonderful law, the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is working itself out in our life. Think about life and peace. Instead of guilt, you get acceptance, you have security, you have an assurance in your life. Instead of hostility, you have a sense of love, you have a friendliness toward others, a kindness. You find yourself reaching out to others. And instead of emptiness, you have a sense of well-being, fulfillment, excitement, vitality, and a fullness. 
And instead of fear, you have peace, inner calm, a quiet spirit, and being able to cope and to handle life. All those things come because the life of God is working itself out in you because your mind is set in that direction. Let me give you a second statement. The second step in a carnal mind, in a mind set on the flesh, is to ignore the process of death. It's to ignore the process of death as a result of wrong decisions. Are you ignoring the guilt, the hostility? Are you ignoring the emptiness? and the fears, all as a result of your mind being set in the wrong direction. But if you are carnally minded, the second step is that you'll just ignore all those indicators of death and continue to go on day after day through life. Now verse 7 says, because the mind is set on the flesh, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. If you are carnally minded, then your mind is in enmity to God. It is a direct contradiction to what God is. James 4.4 4 uses the same word that we have here for hostility. Talking about the one who makes himself a friend of the world, makes himself hostile or an enemy. To God. So a mindset on the flesh is at war with God. It is an enmity to God. It is in hostile. It's, it's, it's hostile to God. It is directly con contrary to anything that God stands for. The way I read this verse, you have two choices. You have pride or you have humility. You need to follow the, your own desires. We can follow the will of God. Every time we follow our own desires, we find ourselves somehow hostile. If you go out and try to play a baseball game your own way without following the rules, you're going to find yourself in, in friction with an umpire. Anytime we try to do it our own way with self on the throne, it is going to cause friction between our lives and the life of God. Characteristics of the flesh, a posture of war you find here, and practical resistance to God. Self is on the throne. That last phrase in verse 7 is hostile toward God, does not subject itself to the law of God, is not even able to do so. Not even able to do so. A person who has a carnal mind is not even capable of doing the will of God, of living out a life that is pleasing to God, of subjecting themselves to the law of God, of literally ordering their life according to the principles of God. There will be pitfalls left and right. If they try to just live that moral life, it will not be accomplished. They will be a failure at it. They are not even able to do so. I had a lady call me this week. She is. She has been going to the uh, the Mormon church. And they want to baptize her there, but she don't want to be baptized because she wants to continue to smoke. She says, I just don't think I can give up smoking. And if they baptize me, they're going to expect me to give up smoking. So we talked about 20 minutes. I was explaining to her, you're putting the, the wrong thing before the other. The way I understand it is that when you come to Christ, surrender your life to Christ, he brings power into your life to deal with issues like smoking. But the natural mind and the natural power cannot even begin to overcome the habits of life that, that, uh, that come against us in our flesh. It says here that they cannot even subject themselves to the law of God. It's not even something they can even begin to do. Well, the third step 
The third statement is, whenever we have a carnal mind, we begin to entertain opposition to the will of God. We begin to rationalize things that are against the will of God. You might find that you begin to rationalize disobedience. You begin to say things like, well, this is the reason why I don't do certain things you know that you should be doing. This is the reason I don't witness. This is the reason why I don't pray more. This is the reason why I don't study my Bible. I know I ought to, but this is my reason. You see, we're at war with God and we don't even realize it. We're living a life that is contrary to Him and every life choice that we are, we're making I don't want to go to church because all they want down there is my money. I don't want to go to church because all the people down there are hypocrites. We begin to defend our opposition to the will of God. In fact, we actually we actually go on record justifying our carnality. When we are carnally minded, we actually go on record justifying our carnality. We make statements justifying and rationalizing why I'm going to be living the way I live. Knowing that it's wrong, this is the reason. We go on record saying this is why. Well, verse, verse 8, it says those who are carnally minded, whose mind is set on the flesh, the fourth thing is they cannot even please God. They live a life, and this is the fourth statement, they live a life that is a disappointment to God. They live a life that is a disappointment to God. Jesus said, my food and drink is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his will. If you're spiritually minded, that's will be the most important thing to you as well. A person who is, who is carnally minded rather than spiritually minded cannot even please God. They don't even desire to please God. They have all these what could have been, what should have been, what would have been. Their life is littered with those things. But they never allowed God to have that important role in their life to be that number one affection in their life. And, and they really don't even think about pleasing God. I hope that's the number one characteristic of my life. I want to please God. You find out if you, you please men and you don't please God, you're a loser. But if you please God and you don't please men, you're a winner. It's an indicator of your of your mindset as to whether pleasing God is the most important thing to you. But if your mind is carnal, it's not even a possibility to please God. You're going to naturally go against the ways of God and gravitate to the ways of the world, which is carnally minded. So maybe tonight the most pleasing thing that God's ears could hear with regard to you it's maybe, God, I'm sorry for disappointing you with my life, for justifying my carnality, for living a life without purpose, ignoring the evidences of death in my life, and for setting my affections on the things of the world. Because if those things are true about you, then your life, your mind, is set in a carnal direction. We think of the, that word for mind. It means your moral affections. It literally means you're bent. You are either bent toward God or you are bent toward the world. When something is bent, it is pointed a certain direction. Everything that comes into your life as an experience goes through a grid. And that grid, if your bent is toward the world, it's going to drive it to the world. No matter what the experience, if your bent is toward God, it's going to drive you to the point of how can I please God? In this particular instance, this circumstance, how can I please God? 
Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Paul saw that as a danger to the spirit-filled life. And I see that as the number one danger of why the church is not filled, truly filled, not just pre pretending to be filled and seeing some craziness that is attributed to being filled with the spirit, but really filled with the dynamic presence of God. The number one reason is we are so carnally minded in many ways because we have, have connected ourselves to the world's wagon and we're following it instead of following God. I'm going to ask you to do it about